Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. I have no idea whether you can hear me or not, and uh, the technical difficulties we had were, were, as usual, a result of the police state trying to suppress the free speech that you see. No, we had some te technical difficulties, folks, and, and now we're getting some feedback. Um, Libertarian Counterpoint uh, is, is a show that's been running for many, many years, and here in Sacramento, uh, you can watch us on uh, Channel 17 on Comcast at 8 o'clock, as you're watching right now, on Thursday, or noon on Saturday, uh, or on my very favorite time, I get up early and have a lot of coffee and some Cheerios at 4 a.m. on Saturday. No, I don't, folks. I'm sleeping soundly then. I usually re-watch the show on YouTube. And uh, when you go to YouTube, uh, uh, please give us some positive comments. Please take that, that uh, YouTube that talks about liberty and libertarian principles. Forward the link to your, your socialist friends. Force them to watch. And perhaps uh, the next election won't be quite as bad as the uh, last one. And on the show tonight, my name is again John Cameron. I'm uh, a fundraiser. Um, my official title is Liberty Society Manager for Pacific Legal Foundation. I raise money so that our pit bull lawyers, and I say that in a kind way, can grab the, uh, uh, the obtrusive government by, by the neck and shake it really hard so it gives back our Bill of Rights and Constitution. And um, we have one of those attorneys with us, Jeremy uh, Talcott. You want to introduce right. yourself? Jeremy Talcott, and as John mentioned, I'm an attorney with Pacific Legal Foundation. Been here in Sacramento for about uh, about a year now. Uh, litigating that calls for, for a drink, I think. I sounds good to me. Okay. And uh, Daniel Sheehan, you want to tell us a little bit about what you do and and. Uh well, yeah, like John said, my name is Daniel Sheehan, and I am the development researcher at Pacific Legal. So I'm responsible for finding any background information on our constituents and uh, looking into potential cases and different things like that just to provide the background and make sure we have a good concrete knowledge of the facts before we go into things. Okay. And uh, if, you, if that offer for a drink is open to him, I'm going to jump in on that as well. <laughs> well, I, I think it's open to you. And John, do you want a drink? Yes, I do. I'm going to have one too, folks. Not right now, though, although sometimes it does appear that we are drinking on the show. It looks like there's <laughs> multiple <laughs> people over here. I'm actually going to back away from that offer of a drink. I don't, yeah. it's no, schizophrenic over here. No, 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 no. It's, it's multiple personality syndrome, folks. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, just very briefly talk about uh, how we came to the Liberty Movement. I came to the Liberty Movement uh, quite early uh, through objectivism and, and uh, Ayn Rand and the rest of that. And I was a true patriot. I thought that, that our government knew what was going on and, and did the right thing. I, I joined the military as a paratrooper and uh, swore an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And when I um, got out of the military and went to school and then went into business, I discovered that our, our, what I thought was our all-seeing, all-good government was actually, in my opinion, in many cases, uh, one of those domestic enemies because they were completely ignoring uh, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and, in essence, the rule of law and acting more like, uh, in many cases, unfortunately, uh, what thugs acted like and what I thought uh, other governments acted like, which is you know why I, I fight um, through the business I'm in uh, to help um, free and, and enforce the Constitution of the United States and why I talk about uh, liberty on this wonderful show, Libertarian Counterpoint. Jeremy, uh, you want to talk about how you came to the liberty movement? Sure. Uh, you know, really, I think it was probably about the mid mid 2000s i really was exposed to some reason foundation and reason magazine there there was all of a sudden kind of a wealth of internet resources and a lot of bloggers that were talking about libertarian uh, ideas and policy and it just instantly resonated with me i think probably over the course of the past you know 10 years before that, I had become disillusioned with sort of both parties and mm -hmm. was really trying to find That's, something can I, that was... Can I pause? And I yeah. know I'm interrupting your, your, your introduction. Both parties, um, we hear a lot of news about the two parties in um, this wonderful United States, and it didn't used to be that way, folks. There were multiple parties, but now these two parties, which are mirrored images of themselves, they're both big government, are all that's really available. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I will just say that, you know, looking at uh, 
looking at those two parties, as I said, neither of the platforms seem to have intellectual consistency. Mm. And that was the one thing that a libertarian position offered, mm. was I, I, if once you have the core ideals in place of individual liberty, you can kind of extrapolate out any of your policy positions, uh, keeping that idea in mind, non-aggression and, and individual, you know, maximization of in individual liberty. So to me, the intellectual consistency that that offered was tremendously appealing, uh, and I've been s devoting my time to it ever since. And, and thank you for doing that. Now, Daniel, tell us how you came to the liberty movement, a little bit of your background. Well, I started no, out no, <laughs> more conservative, or because my family was conservative, mm. and usually you kind of pick up your beliefs from the people around you. Yes, you do. And <laughs> so I was trying to read a bunch of conservative sources, and I accidentally stumbled across some libertarian ones along the way. Mm. And I found that the, he called it intellectual consistency, mm -hmm. just stood out to me. I was like, wow, there's a whole philosophy that we could be basing this upon. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what I really wanted was to find a way to help people be able to maximize their own personal opportunity mm. so they can make the most of their own lives. Mm. And this idea that it starts with the individual and that if we give that individual power, he can make decisions in his life mm. was really or powerful she, to me. Let's not be sexist. Or she, or she. Yeah, he or she. We're talking the generic, the human, the human being. This is true. Be, this is yeah. true. But yeah, so that any individual would be able to better themselves. And there was a quote that Penn Jillette, who's one of my favorite thinkers, mm. he, he was talking about how a lot of the time people will ask, how can I fix this problem with government? And he's like, well, if there's no other option, then sure, we can look to government. But what I always ask those people is, can we solve this problem with more freedom? Mm. And can usually we, the answer is yes. Can we solve this more problem with more freedom um, and are most problems caused by less freedom? And I'd say the answer to that, to both those things, is um, yes. So uh, we talk about topics. I know we don't make this stuff up, folks. Um, and um, we're, we're going to talk about a topic that uh, uh, one of the thinkers here on this panel thinks is, is a great idea. And I'm not certain where I stand on it. You want to tell us about this, uh, this recent um, yeah, this sure. Thing? Uh, earlier this week, uh, Governor Jerry Brown here in, in California mm -hmm. uh, signed a bill requiring that in the school system, feminine hygiene products will be available in schools mm -hmm. for the, in the women's schools. bathrooms. So this, these are, aren't these certain schools? Well, I, I, think where it's, I think it's focused towards certain schools because they're the ones that aren't necessarily providing right now. But I believe the legislation is supposed to be that all schools mm -hmm. would have these basic feminine hygiene products available. Now, is this so, only for low-income students? Or is well, no, it's, it's not for low-income students. It, it's that it would be provided in the bathrooms themselves, mm -hmm. which to me sounds like great policy because we don't have a problem, at least currently, we don't have a problem with there being state-run schools. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone on this panel would prefer that the federal government be involved in that system. But at a state level, I think, well, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think, but at least personally, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of a state-run school system. Um, as long as there is also competition from a private school system. Mm. So if we are open to this idea of state-run schools, then the question is, what should they provide? And I don't think any of us would have a problem with them having toilet paper in those schools. So what's, what's the holdup to Bring them having own, feminine folks. hygiene? No, products? I'm just... <laughs> so it, it seems like to, this is just a basic fundamental policy that can and should be implemented by a government. Mm. What do you think, Jeremy? Yes, no? Yeah, I'd probably go with the plan B of I'd prefer that we got the state out of public schools as much as possible. So mm -hmm. I, I would say I think to the extent that we do have state-run public schools, I wouldn't particularly have a problem with them having it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I would prefer to move towards some sort of a, 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 a more open and market-based system mm -hmm. where schools are free to choose whether or not they do or do not offer those products and mm -hmm. also uh, rather than the schooling being paid for by absolutely everyone, we instead have a more direct link. You know, programs such as voucher programs, I think, mm. are really beneficial towards moving towards mm. that type of a, the consumer is actually making the decision of where they want to allocate mm. the resources rather than from a top-down, all state schools are going to operate mm. in the same way. I think mm. that, uh, you know, with states running the schools, we still get some, some, uh, 
per, you know, uh, experimentation among the, among the states, but I would prefer to see even more experimentation within the states. So um, you brought up you brought up the and we could talk about vouchers all evening and we might talk about it over that drink we're going to have later, <laughs> folks. And no, I'm not saying where we're going, um, <laughs> but I'll give you the address. No, I won't. Um, recent studies that I've read indicate that um, I, I think that the the establishment, the government, the control folks, especially California Teachers Association, or as I lovingly refer to them, the Communist Teachers Association. Um, uh, their their motto, by the way, is ruining the minds of generations. No, it isn't, but I, I think it probably should be. Um, they fight uh, vouchers tooth and nail and somehow paint it as a, a rich man's, I'm sure a rich white man, because uh, we're all evil. Not that I'm rich, especially the IRS, if you're listening, I'm not rich. Um, somehow benefit from the voucher program, but all of the studies that I've seen indicate that uh, invariably it's minorities and the poor that are about 70 percent in favor of taking back control of their schools through a voucher program. Isn't that, is that what you've, you've seen? That understand? seems to be, uh, the, the areas where it's been tried, the areas where vouchers have been introduced, you see an increased uh, desire to, uh, as I said, take interest in children's schooling and make the best choices possible. Mm. And what vouchers do, the well-off already have the well ability. Well-off already send their kids locally to, I could name the schools, but I think I'm to allowed private to. private schools. And yeah. they're like, yeah. they're like $20,000 a year and they send them because that's how valuable their children's good education is to them. Unfortunately, the poor are forced to suffer in the schools that are, are provided with, with no accountability by this government-run, state-run school system. So, well, so it's sort of, I just yeah. want to follow up on that a little bit because it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that the poor kids from the poor neighborhoods go to the schools that have less money. Mm. And since the schools have less money and they have less resources and they don't really believe in the kids as much, the kids don't perform as well and they stick in those impoverished areas. Mm. And then their kids go to the same schools mm. and they're stuck in this cycle of poverty and they can't get out of it. Mm. So it's interesting that a lot of people would criticize school vouchers as helping the rich when the whole point of the school voucher is to help the kids who would be able to rise up and, and belong in those mm. private schools, belong in the better system that their families, even if their families might not have enough money, through the school vouchers can send their kids to a better place and they can break that cycle of poverty. I agree. Now let's go back to the point that you brought up. So given that we do have this public school system, right. given that we do have a whole bunch of poor people going to these public schools, I think there's a connection here, folks. I should call them government schools. Should we provide a, a basic, and, and we might as well call it a necessity, feminine hygiene products to, to those people who are too poor to purchase them themselves, and perhaps if they don't have them available at the school, they would not go. Mm -hmm. um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It's a few pennies. Uh, just cut out one of the extra days that, um, to just cut one administrator's salary per school district and you'd pay for all of it. It'd, it'd be a simple thing. You're That'd in my mind, my I was about to suggest, if, if, if we had the trade-off again, now, now I'm going to plan C. But plan C, <laughs> which yeah, is I will, I, will, I will give another product in the, in the school. Uh, you, each yeah. product that you pick, ditch one administrator. Ditch one and administrator. I, I'll, I'll vote. Yeah. Yeah. I'll vote you want yes. books? Yeah, Fine. I will, I will go for of, that plan yeah. C. Get rid of an administrator. <laughs> uh, if you look at, uh, somebody brought up on the show a while back, folks, uh, um, the uh, I think it's the Catholic uh, school system in, in New York. Uh, they went in and asked somebody how many people were in their administrative, uh, or basically in the administrative system that runs this huge school district, which probably is as big as the LA school district, which has literally thousands of administrative peoples and people. And the person said, I don't know, I don't know, let me count them. And it was literally a number that they could count. <laughs> like 75 or 150 or something. So big difference, folks. And now let's go on to the next topic. Um, and it uh, um, has to do with uh, constitutionality and our president, uh, President Twitter, I mean President Trump, um, decided that uh, uh, certain classes of people should be held to uh, higher uh, accountability for travel into this country and in some cases banned completely. And those people are, are members of uh, a, a religious uh, group, Muslims. 
and um, a judge in Maryland and a judge in, I believe, Hawaii. Same judge that banned them last time or different judge in Hawaii? I'm not sure if it was the same one, but I know it's the same district court. Oh, okay. Decided that this new uh, ban on travel uh, violated the law against discrimination. Uh, Daniel, you want to open on this one and tell us what you think? Yeah, so this is an interesting one for me because the president does have the authority to enforce immigration laws mm -hmm. and to institute certain regulations or, or certain ways of managing immigration. Mm -hmm. But the president also does not have the right to violate the Constitution, and he doesn't have the right to pass essentially Jim Crow laws that are intended to hurt one specific group of people. Mm. Now, on the campaign trail, uh, Trump repeatedly talked about how he was going to ban Muslims. Mm. And once he got into office, it became very clear that his policy that he had passed regarding immigration was actually a Muslim ban in disguise, which was why it was essentially a Jim Crow law mm -hmm. and was struck down by multiple courts. Mm -hmm. They've tried to revise it several times and try and make it more focused on immigration rather than focused on a ban on Muslims. Mm. The most recent modifications were they also included Venezuela and North Korea to the travel ban because in that way you can make the claim that it's talking about national security. Mm. That part of the reason they would ban these people is because North Korea is a national security risk. Venezuela obviously is in the midst of warfare right now, so it's, mm. uh, it's a place where there would potentially be dangerous immigration. Mm. So there's more of a claim that Trump has to this being an actual national security measure. Mm. But it also got struck down again because it's still focused primarily on Muslim-majority countries. Mm. What's interesting to me is that when Trump passed this, they did not include North, or they didn't include Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the place where the most actual acts of terrorism on U.S. soil have emerged from. Mm. So if the purpose of your policy was to ban dangerous countries, mm. so why didn't they include Saudi Arabia? Mm. And the answer would appear to be because money. Mm. Because we have business ties mm. with Saudi Arabia, or or, or Washington D.C., or or, or, I mean, or poli political that, ties. Yeah, sure, that that's but where most of the danger to the American public comes from, right there, folks. <laughs> True, it's make it illegal for them to travel. Um, so, is this uh, um, should uh, Trump be able to pick out a certain cl religious class and say that all of the people belonging to this religious class are are a danger to the United States, and and also, by the way, people from Venezuela and people from uh, North Korea, or is this just a shell game to try to pacify uh, the electorate that uh, thinks all Muslims are bad? Is this this attempt to eventually bring us to a, uh, a, a religious state, a Christian state, which our, our founding fathers apparently were pretty dead set, even though they were hardcore Christian, uh, against having uh, a religious state. They wanted to isolate religion from politics. What do you think? Well, I, you know, I, I'd say I think what, what I find most interesting about this is that, as Daniel noted, it was statements made on the campaign trail. Mm. And at some point, uh, imputing all of those statements to actions taken now becomes more and more tenuous. And especially as the... the uh, elements of the ban are, are, are modified, mm -hmm. adding North Korea and uh, Venezuela, for example. So I, I think that, the to me, the interesting question is, do I think that under current Supreme Court precedent, this would probably be considered constitutional? I think yes. Really? For me, I, I think there's a very good argument that at some point it does become constitutional. Mm -hmm. um, it's because the evidence to, it, to show that discriminatory intent is getting further and further removed. Hmm. Uh, so I, I think Because it's very, of the inclusion of, of these right. other threatening it, states. It, they and now can see, make the argument yeah, that it is a national security policy. Yeah, that, see, and, I, I would kind yeah. of question, you know, there's some other countries I would throw in the loop, and I'd agree with you that Saudi Arabia should be on that because they finance terrorism. But apparently if you give enough to certain unnamed charitable organizations and, and have enough oil, you can you can still finance terror and it's okay. I, I think I think yes, but of course you know this is an area where the president's powers are traditionally considered very strong, mm -hmm. and the uh, the question of whether or not he needs to uh, 
uh, you know, any president needs to solve all security risks mm. with a single sweeping ban. You know, traditionally that's not been the case at all. Mm. So I think, again, I, I think that all of these cases have been outliers in terms of kind of our, our more, uh, what I would have expected from Supreme Court precedent. Uh, but I will, I will caveat all of that with, do I think any of it is good policy? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, yeah. Uh, if we could do this sweeping travel ban on everybody that's gonna try to kill us, I mean, that would be you know, fine. But how do you identify them without creating even more of a police state than we already have? So uh, going on to um, talking about uh, people's rights not to travel but to speak, um, something that the Constitution feels uh, very strongly about, talk about it as if it's a person. It's one of my favorite people. You know, it's the Constitution, folks. Um, <laughs> Richard Spencer, what to do with Richard Spencer? Is there anything to be done? Is it any more harmful for Richard Spencer to spout uh, white nationalist speech, whatever that means, than somebody to uh, talk ab about uh, uh, taking wealth away from Americans who've um, saved and worked and put in 80-hour weeks and instead of giving it to the kids, uh, hand it out to other folks who haven't? I mean, is any form of, of uh, rhetoric more, other than yelling fire in a, in a, a full theater when there is no fire, is, the worst, is, is the any? The worst court case and yeah. the worst analogy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then you can, you can tear it apart. I will. Uh, uh, then that's why we got the lawyer here, folks. So uh, why Richard Spencer? What's wrong with Richard? You brought this up. What do you think? Is yeah, he, is I, he, I did bring up Richard, but before I get to that, I want to hear his uh, <laughs> what what the limits should be on speech, or if there should be limits on speech. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm pretty much a free speech absolutist. I think you counter speech with speech. I think the worst thing you can do is try to stop speech hmm. uh, through any sort of force or government. I think that historically we know that the people who are able to stop speech are those in the majority, and they mm. stop minority speech. Mm. Now, I'm shocked by that. And, and anybody who, I'm, I just completely disagree, because if you look at nighttime news, you will obviously see a fair and equal treatment of all political parties by popular media. No, I'm just being sarcastic <laughs> as heck, folks. Uh, those in power silence those who do not have power, and it's happened constantly. So tell us about this court case and why it was such a bad precedent. Well, it was, it was used to justify uh, incarcerating people who handed out pamphlets in World War I, mm -hmm. uh, encouraging people to avoid the draft. Mm. And the analogy, you know, there's a limit on free speech. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That's... If it's even, if we even assume it is a good analogy, it's, it's for incitement. Mm. You are not, it's not the speech that's actually a criminal action. What it's you've done is right. you've forced people to run. Your words, the way you have said them, have forced action mm. that leads to actual harm, people getting stampeded mm. as they run out the doors. So the analogy was that by asking people to, um, to avoid the draft or service or whatever that was creating harm because you were you were asking them to create or, or to perform a criminal act. You, you were right? inciting them inciting to the, the to, action yeah. of avoiding. It was a terrible yeah. analogy because, of mm. course, these were people who were mailing out pamphlets mm. to people who were uh, potentially going to be drafted, mm. conscripted into the war, telling them you should, you know, the war, the war is wrong, and whether or not mm. that's right or wrong, you know, they were saying you should avoid it. You should not. Uh, mm -hmm. You should not comply with the draft. You should uh, disobey these orders. Mm -hmm. And it was pure speech. Mm -hmm. And this terrible analogy was used to send those people to jail. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I kind of, I like what you said. Uh, uh, you, you battle speech with speech, or you battle speech with just not listening. Uh, that would that would be my uh, or or nice noise canceling headphones. They work now, folks. And I, I will yeah. just jump in to say the best countering of speech I have seen yet in Florida. Richard Spencer is uh, going to be speaking at University of Florida and a local brewery. For every two tickets to Richard Spencer's, these are free tickets anyone could hand, but they are reserved seating. Mm. For every two tickets that you bring to the brewery, you get a pint of cold beer and they will destroy those tickets. So mm. using the marketplace, 
they are hoping to leave Richard Spencer speaking in front of an empty auditorium. So now, I, and I, I, I want to talk about this a, a little. We're, I think we'll just stay here. We were going to talk about uh, the NFL and, and Kaepernick and good or bad and <laughs> kneeling or standing and the flag and blah, blah, blah. But I think this is, that's, you know, free speech as well. And I think let, let's stay on the nuts and bolts of free speech here. Mm -hmm. So what, what's so wrong with, what's um, Richard Spencer saying that, that people are so upset about? Well, okay, so my, my friend was actually at the speech that he gave today uh, and was part of the ones who participated in that whole, mm -hmm. I'll take the ticket and I'll get, throw it away to them and get a beer for it and everything. But uh, he and, and a couple of the other kids at Florida, they bought as many tickets as they could mm -hmm. so that they could throw them away mm -hmm. uh, in that manner. And, but my friend, because he was interested in hearing actual points. He actually mm. went and watched the speech, and so he was talking about what Spencer was talking about. And mm. so Spencer's point is that culture is best when it is following Western ideals mm. and is ethnocentric to white people. Mm. So Richard Spencer is not advocating for violence against African Americans or minorities. Mm. But he is advocating that we peacefully, I don't know if this would even be peaceful, but he says it would be peaceful to push them out mm. so that the country would only be white. Mm. Which In, country? Uh, the, United the United States. States. Yeah, that's, that's his goal. Huh. So there are a lot of people who believe that by saying these sorts of things, he is advocating violence. Mm. And that's I don't agree with that argument. So because your, the, your friend that reported to you, did right. he hear at any time Richard Spencer advocating no. violence? No, no. Richard Spencer is a very smart individual. Okay. He mm -hmm. is probably a very dangerous individual, but he is also a well-educated mm -hmm. and well-spoken individual. Mm. On that note, we're not we're not promoting Richard Spencer. We'll give you no. time to, to on another show to uh, somebody of another ilk who's promoting, um, I don't know, uh, redistribution of wealth, whatever that means. Uh, which I find is as as abhorrent, <laughs> because you know basically wealth is what creates health and freedom. Uh, people talk about natural foods and and grass-fed beef, and uh, when folks are rich, they're healthy. And on that note, I think I'm going to ask you to um, watch us again and say thank you very much for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much, Jeremy Talcott. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Sheehan, for participating in this lively, if mostly agreeable, debate. Uh, <laughs> please watch us uh, on YouTube. Uh, watch us Thursday Night Live so you can catch us in our uh, faux pas, five pas, six pas, because we make a lot of mistakes here, folks. <laughs> so thank you very much again for watching Libertarian Counterpoint. Have a wonderful evening. Let's go have a drink.